Now this morning, I want us to continue in this little epistle of Jude, and I remind you that Jude was writing something that he didn't want to write. (laughs) But more importantly, well, maybe we should put it this way. He was writing something that he didn't initially want to write. God changed his mind about that. I'm sure he wanted to write what he wrote after God got a hold of him and had him write what he did write. Something very profound, something very important to us. And he has gone into excruciating, I think you would agree with that if you've been here, detail, explaining to us by example and by by all kinds of nature pictures and everything else, the terrible effect that apostasy has upon the church and what is proclaimed as the kingdom of God on the earth. And we had our first admonition back in verse 17, a little bit of a change. Always comes when you see that little but there. And we are told there to remember the words of the apostles. And we have tried to emphasize that. But now, this morning, beginning in verse 20 and and the verses that follow, we have our second admonition, and it is very personal as well, because he once again uses that little phrase, beloved, beloved. And he is going to give us an exclusive remedy. Now, I've never been very much on Bible how-tos, because I look at this book as much more than a manual for how we go to it and go through here and try to extract certain things and say, now this is how I'm going to to make my life uh, religiously work. The There are how-tos in the Word of God, but we need to be careful, because the Word of God is always a supernatural matter. And so we can get all the mechanics right, but we can miss true knowledge, true understanding, true relationship with Christ. But I would say to you today that Jude is going to give us something of a how-to, but that how-to has a supernatural framework about it. And so with that, hopefully, wetting of your appetite, uh, we're going to look again today, beginning at verse 20 and 21. I think the outline shows I'm going to go further than that. I'm not sure I'll make it. Probably that means I won't, but, um, but we'll see how things go. Let me ask God's mercy on our time of study together. Father, we recognize when we come to your word that it is so precious. Help me to somehow or another be able to communicate that. How desperately we need you. We need your word today. There's not a person here, and certainly not me, that doesn't need to have our minds and hearts filled up with what is really good and what is really important. I pray Thee, Father, that by Your Holy Spirit that we might accomplish something here today. We have no desire just to be religious, just to have met in some kind of a religious way. But, Father, we want to know You. We want to know what it means to live for You. We desire, first and foremost, Father, to please You, and yet we know we fail continuously. We thank You that You are patient with us and enduring, and we pray, Father, that you would be merciful to us today. Gracious Father, help me to be able to speak and to communicate your word properly. Oh, use this time. Every person here speak to hearts and minds that when we leave here, we'll be better equipped, convicted of heart, desiring to please you. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 
I heard this week on the news, and uh, you may have heard it as well, that they had recently taken some kind of a survey, and it was a religious survey, and they found that the line, the needle is moving, even in these, what I would classify as pretty broad or even to a degree superficial surveys they take of people and their religion, and they have found that now that 20% of the people in the United States of America have no claim to any form of belief. And further than that, they said that what they call the Protestant church is shrinking in America for the first time. That now less than 50% of the people surveyed have any claim to any form of Protestantism. And when they surveyed younger adults that about these things, those that didn't profess anything, some of the things that they said would indicate that they didn't really understand what the church was even for. didn't seem clear to them. They thought in their minds that the church seemed to be against some things like gay marriage and, and uh, abortion, but they didn't really understand what all this talk about love was and yet how that didn't conform with the church's embrace, or some of the church's embrace, of gay marriage and abortion. I was listening the other night to, and you may have seen this before, uh, Ravi Zacharias as he was speaking at Columbia University and taking questions from the students at Columbia. Very revealing. And he's a very brilliant man, a man that knows God and has walked with God for a number of years, and God has used him. And they were asking him hard questions, and somebody asked a question about the church in America, and he basically put the, uh, put the, the question to bed, something along the lines of the church in America has failed. It has lost its way. It has gone after the things that are shallow and weak, and thinking has come out of the church of America with its desire to entertain and embrace the world and the world system. And we, this is my own words, but we have reared, as we have said a number of times, a generation that does not know God, is what this means. And they don't even know what's right or wrong. And they, and they certainly know nothing about the sinful condition of man, which is what the Bible is all about. The loss of man's relationship with God in the Garden of Eden and the restoration of that relationship that comes only through Jesus Christ. They know nothing of hell, nothing of accountability, nothing of the truth. Why? Because the church has not been teaching true love which is found in a relationship with Christ, who is the righteous Lord and the only God with whom we have to do. But they instead are producing a message devoid of substance. It is confusion. It is false and weak and non-biblical. And it has no power. It has no power to save. It has no power to convict. And it has no ability to please God or help you and I find truth and righteousness in Christ that we so desperately need. That being stated, Jude brings the same issue to you and me. Think with me of this. Jude was written 2,000 years ago. And it was written to warn the church in the most exhaustive terms about the apostasy that was to come. And has that apostasy come? Yes. I never thought when I was a little boy that we'd be living in any kind of day like we are today. I just never thought that would... I couldn't conceive of such a thing. Now we're in Sodom and Gomorrah. Actually, I think we may have passed them up. And the question that then we have to ask ourselves... Living in the midst of this is what are we going to do? What are you going to do? Succumb to it? Crawl in a cave and hide? 
put your head in the sand and hope it goes away. Just sort of grit your teeth and say, I'll just endure this. How do we keep ourselves and your precious families, you that have little children here, you that have young adults here, and you that are young adults and children, and all of us, how do we keep ourselves, as Jude will later say, from stumbling and falling prey to the age in which we live? Well, Jude tells us how. It's very simple. I think it's something that is throughout the Word of God. And what we need today, ultimately what we need is a vision of Christ. Because that's what the Bible, that's what truth, that's what hope is all about. But that vision of Christ is found in these things that we're going to read today in verses 20 and 21. We could call it strengthening our faith. Our faith needs to be strengthened. We need to quit kowtowing. We need to quit bowing the knee to all of this and throwing in the towel. We need to quit being lazy and listless and confused ourselves. But we need to be strong in the faith. We need to contend for the faith. As Jude said at the very beginning. Now, With that, he gives us four commands to combat apostasy. Now, these are not nice ideas, or these are not little things that we can do when you don't have anything else to do in your busy life. They are commands, if not obeyed, and not obeyed and not believed, will cause failure individually and corporately in the church of the living God. And so the question comes for me, And for you, will we believe what God has said? Oh, you say, well, of course I will. Well, will you? Because true belief comes when you and I do. Not just say or think theoretically about somehow, but it becomes a part of us. Look with me, please, to start with at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, and I want to just remind you that what we're talking about in the day in which we live, which this is so, it's always been apropos since Christ was here, but it's particularly apropos now. In Luke 18, we know that he's talking here in this context about the coming of, the Lord is talking about his second coming. We are close, no question about it, to His second coming. I don't know when that is. I'm not making a prediction today. But it could be before the day's over. We are in the last days. And the issue is, as the writing of Hebrews says, yet in a little while, and the Lord shall come. Now in Luke 18, beginning up there in verse 1, The Lord Jesus was saying, Now He was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. That's going to be one of the things that we'll be discussing today. And He's encouraging His people. Why? Because there's a whole lot of discouraging things going on. And He says, beginning down in verse 7, Will not God bring about justice for His elect who cry to Him day and night? And will He delay long over them? One of these days, when Christ returns and all of this stuff that's going on now will be insignificant, it will be behind us, and perhaps even basically such a faint memory in our minds that we would hardly even ever think of such a thing. That's hard for us to understand right now, but it's true. But Christ goes on to say in verse 8, I will tell you that He will bring about justice for them quickly. Do you believe that? Those that are in Christ are going to shine like the sun. We're the ones that are going to win, quote, quote unquote, when Christ returns. 
and win for all eternity. He says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? And I think that's alluding to the fact that the protraction of Christ's return, as Peter talks about and others talk about, is so long and causes so much endurance and requires so much patience, requires extended faith and all of that, that many, as Christ would say, many's hearts grow wax. They grow cold and indifferent and they just say, ah, oh, pooey. It's just not worth it. It's just too tiring. It's too hard. It's too serious. It's too much trouble. I just don't have it within me to be able to do that. But we're without excuse. Because God through Jude has given us what we must do to combat apostasy. So that we and so that our church will not become just another of the many casualties that churches that have lost their lampstand. And when someone loses their lampstand, as Christ speaks of in Revelation 2 and 3, they are useless. They are useless. And when we individually lose our lampstand, we too are useless. So let's look at spiritual growth beginning... In verse 20, in the first part of that, but you, but you, and notice again, beloved, and this is the little word agapitos, it's the highest form of love. This means that Jude is addressing what he believes to be true Christians, and this is important because it's not something that we are to do in order to be saved. He's not talking to those that need to be saved, but He's talking to those that have a profession of faith in Christ. But this is something, a message for those who have believed to contend for the faith. And He says, once you have accepted Christ, that's all you need, and you just... Live your life any old way you want to. That's the carnal Christian mindset. No, that's not what he says. You're to build yourselves up on. It's developing a faith that already exists. It's building on the faith that we already have. We should be stronger in faith tomorrow than we were Today, than we are today, and stronger in faith the day after that than we are tomorrow. We're to build ourselves up. And he says, your most holy faith. The idea here is that it is personal and that it is precious. Holy has with it, of course, set apart. It's a set apart faith. And this is what distinguishes you and me and our faith in Christ from everybody else and their darkness and their confusion on the face of the earth. Oh, you say, I would never abandon my faith. If you said that, you probably have that in your mind. This can't happen to me. Do you think these churches, even this that Jude is writing to, the church that Paul talked to, Ephesian church, and all these Ephesian elders and all these different individuals, that they had it in their mind that they would ever abandon the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints? This most holy faith that is most precious. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul, in this context, is talking about he disciplines his life. Paul now, mind you. No small believer, no individual that didn't have a radical change in his life in which he was completely devoted to Christ, but he didn't arrogantly say to himself, I've got it made now. I'm sitting on top of the mountain. 
But he said, I discipline my body. I beat my body. I hold it in subjection. And, and then when he gets down to verse 12, he says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. And he goes, if we back up to verse 11, he's talking about the things of the Old Testament happen to us as examples unto us. And what do we have there? Moses. <laughs> One of the greatest men in the Old Testament couldn't enter the promised land because he didn't obey God. Or how about King Saul? God judged him, took away the spirit from him. How about David with Bathsheba? How about Solomon who let his heart be turned at the end of his days because of all these foreign women that he married and connected with? How about Hezekiah of all things? After the Lord gave him 15 more years of life and he messed up after that. Our good king Asa that denied the Lord in his last days. And we can go on and on for that Samson or whoever it is. These things were given to us as an example. You see, your focus of attention, and he's talking here interestingly back in Jude, building yourselves up as if it's you and me, that can do that ourselves. But we do have, as the focus here, a responsibility in that. But under that responsibility of building ourselves up is the understanding that we can't do anything. As Christ said in John 15, without me you can do nothing. Or Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who works in you to will and to work his good pleasure. So there's this always this mixing of responsibility that we have and we're accountable for with the understanding that God must be working. Now, he says, build yourselves in the love of God. Excuse me. Build yourselves up on the most holy faith. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Sounds like something um, selfish, doesn't it? 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 16. Here's this pastoral epistle. And here's Timothy, a man of God. In fact, Paul proclaims him, there's just no one like Timothy, my son in the faith. And yet Paul gives him this admonition in verse 16 of chapter 4. Pay close attention to yourself. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. Why? Because no one's exempt from the wiles of the devil. And no one is super duper. None of us have an S on our chest here in this life. We're all weak. We're all vulnerable. We all need the strength of God. And so what he's talking about here is, Timothy, don't just give yourself to everybody in every cause, running in every direction, but have you really sat down and evaluated yourself Are you paying attention to yourself and your relationship with God? Is it everything all the time that it should be? I have to do that too, you know. We all have to do that. Because he says here, because for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself. The Christian life is a battle. It's never a walk in the park. It's never a picnic. That doesn't mean it isn't wonderful and good, but I'm saying it's always a battle, that we're fighting a spiritual battle in a fallen world. That's why it's so hard, and that's why people fall into apostasy. And if we don't pay attention to that, you can't ensure your own salvation, and then you can't be of any blessing to anybody else. 
which He was supposed to be, both for yourself and for those who hear you. You cannot be useful to God and be be with a blessing to your spouse. Mom and dad, you can't be a blessing to your children. You can't be a blessing to your parents. You can't be a blessing to your neighbor. You can't be a blessing to the church unless you're first a blessing to yourself. How could you possibly be? How can I be? How can anybody be? And we have to, first of all, if you want to call it that, get our own act together. And here Jude says, we need to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. What does this mean? What does this mean? Go with me to Acts chapter 20 again. Acts chapter 20, where we have... Paul talking to these Ephesian elders. And there's such a context of warning them of apostasy. It is so significant what he's doing here. It's almost amazing what he is telling them about how he prayed night and day. And, and, and this, is, this is the chief piece of instruction that he wants to leave with them, that he knows that even after his departure, ravenous wolves will rise from within the, their own elders. That's the way Satan operates. And he says, and now in verse 32, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. Why? Which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified, set apart. And that sanctification process in this life is a growth process. Now you'll notice... And you say, well, this is like apple pie and Chevrolet. We know this. But it is able, the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. We know that. I think we take it for granted, but we then we kind of have a tendency to walk away from it and not recognize the significance and the essentiality of it. What will keep you and me from... Ruin. What will keep us from falling apart? The word of His grace, which is able to build us up. Christianity can never be separated from the word of God. Now, people have been trying to do this. Uh, they've tried to make church more social, more emotional, more psychological. Uh, and and, and they've, they've tried to... To, to use the, the Bible as sort of a launching board for all kinds of other platitudes and, and, and uh, feel-goodisms and ear-tickling things and, and social activities and everything else to be warm and fuzzy. And, and the, the essence and the meat and the truth has been overshadowed and watered down and becomes something that has no power and no conviction. And what Paul is talking about here with these Ephesians then re requires a commitment and an effort. It requires for you and me and our busy schedule of life to make sure that there's a priority of being in the Word of God. It's not just what church you attend. That's a big deal. But it's a priority in the Word of God that you be in the Word of God and that you get your gas tank filled up and that you take opportunities to do that. And there are all sorts of opportunities. I don't think anybody is going to be able to stand before Christ and say, well, you know, I just I tried, but I couldn't find the Word of God. Beloved, it's in books, it's on the internet, it's on the radio. It's on the TV. Now, you've got to be selective because there's a lot of junk out there. But there is a lot of good things out there as well. And one of the things that we need to do is to be in the Word ourselves so that we have discernment and we can identify the junk from that which is beneficial and building us up. Your mind is being fed. My mind is being fed every day with the husk of the hog pen. And we need the Word of God. To strengthen us. You've been feeling down and out lately? Well, that's because you haven't seen Christ. And that's because if I'm feeling down and out, I haven't seen Christ. Because you can't see Christ and be down and out. 
It's just impossible. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He has all of this mess in His hands. He's not going... He's overcome the world. And if we're in Him, we too will overcome the world. You know, if you're... And years ago, you might find this hard to believe, but I used to do that. I used to lift weights when I was a young man. And uh, I found out if you wanted to have some muscles on your body, you had to lift weights. And there was no two ifs, ands, or buts about it. You just had to do it. And as a matter of fact, I also found out if you don't lift weights and all you do is sit around and sit at the table and eat all day, it's the wrong things at that, all those muscles are going to atrophy and just turn into fat or something else. I don't know what they are, but they're not muscle. <laughs> God has given us these physical descriptions that we might understand spiritually the same thing. If I'm going to be developed in the things of God which are the most precious, he says here, holy faith, then I have to be in His Word. And I have to be, as it were, lifting weight in His Word. And as Paul talked about discipline, Christianity can never be stagnant or stand still. May I just point you to one other passage in John, the Gospel of John chapter 8, where Christ was speaking. And this has always been an intriguing passage to me. In John 8.31, He's speaking to Jews who were believing in Him. So many people put so much stock in belief or acceptance or whatever, but they don't, don't go beyond that because there's different forms of belief. That's why James said, you, you believe in God, you do well. The demons also believe and they tremble. John 8.31, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed Him, if... Well, that's a very important word there, isn't it? If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. There is a requirement. There's a lot that can be said here. I understand that. But there is a requirement of continuance in God's word. We can't leave this subject without going to Psalm 119. Go with me to Psalm 119 because let's understand that this was not some super Christian in Psalm 119. He has given us this that we might understand what a Christian, a true child of God, heart should be like. The heart of the psalmist here. In fact, I believe that's what all the psalms are given. They're very transparent that we might understand what it really means to have a relationship with God. And think with me in Psalm 119. Look at verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure, i.e. from apostasy? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's powerful, isn't it? Is there some way to think in terms of, well, now that just doesn't really apply to me? Is your heart entwined with this, the heart of this man? Look down at verse uh, 38. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. It produces something in you and me. A reverence here is, a, is an appropriate understanding of God in my life such that I have fear and I really want to please Him. He says, Turn away my reproach which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. It's the Word of God that revives us. And so often we're looking everywhere else but to the Word of God. Look at verse 72. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Do you think he really means that or he's just exaggerating? 
Brother, he means it. Verse 92. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. And if you, the, the law of God, the truth of God, the, the Word of God is not your delight, I can declare to you, you will perish in your relationship with God. It wasn't real to start with because it's not going to last. You're not building your life on the rock. And when the storms of life come, when the apostasy comes, when the pressures come, when all of this junk moves through and gets and pushes you to be sidetracked, you'll perish unless the Word of God is your delight. Look at verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. It's where you get your substance for living. It's where your foundation, your fundamentals for life and living find themselves. Do you get the idea? He's saying that this is top priority. This is real Christianity. Do you love God's Word? Are you seeking to know it? Is it a priority in your life? When Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, and he said, Study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Do you think he was just telling him that to, something to do on the side? He was giving him a command, an instruction. My friend, the Christian life is built around this. And that's what's amazing to me about churches that don't preach and teach the Word of God. What do they have? They have nothing. They're not worth anything. I'm not trying to pick on people. I wish everybody was preaching and teaching the Word of God. It used to be generally that way. When I was a little child, there may have been disagreements about baptism or something else, but merely, basically everybody was exalting Jesus Christ and preaching His Word and the importance and the power of that Word, and they've abandoned that today. It's impossible to claim Christ and at the same time have no real genuine interest in His Word. Now you think about that. Christ said when He came... In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He's inseparable from His Word. God makes that perfectly clear. And this is where our faith is built today. And this is where we must stand. It's built around the Word of God. And the Word of God must be Growing in our life, I won't get you to turn there, but 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Well, let's, let's do go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We have a wonderful picture here, and I know you're probably aware of this. Chapter 3, verse 15 to 18. Paul says that to this day, whenever Moses is read, he's talking about the books of the law. A veil lies over their heart. That was Israel. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Has the veil been taken away for you? Is this just so many words in a book and so many precepts and nice ideas and religious thoughts? No. But if you've truly turned to the Lord, the veil gets removed. And this becomes something supernatural, something wonderful. It becomes the priority again of the life. He says, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. What is he saying there? He's saying that as we look into this law of liberty, this Word of God, it's like looking in a mirror. And a mirror that day 
wasn't glass like we have today with a perfect reflection. It was a brass, as smooth a brass as you could find, and you had to polish the brass in order to see your face in, in, in what was the mirror. And he's saying just like the Word of God is like that. As we're in the Word of God and studying, it's like we're rubbing it. We're, we're polishing the Word of God. And, and the more and more we polish it, we see an image in that Word. And we're not just seeing the image of ourselves, he says, but we're being transformed from glory to glory just as or into the Lord. And it's really by the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Word of God does. We're becoming, if we're in the Word and growing in the Word, more and more the image of Jesus Christ. So that when He says, when He returns, will He find faith on the earth? What He should be finding is a bunch of individuals that look and think and act like Him. Not that any of us can do that perfectly. But we're of the same mind and of the same heart and of the same desires, of the same loves. It's a crazy thought and even ridiculous to think that people could think that they can have a relationship with Jesus Christ when they don't love the same things He loves. When they're involved in deceit, when they're involved in darkness, when they love the things of this life instead of the life to come, when they don't have the very mind of Christ. And that's why it is essential that when Christ returns, will He find faith on the earth? Will He find you and me in truth? No shams. No cover-ups. Will He find us of the same heart and mind as Himself? Otherwise, you and I wouldn't fit in heaven anyway. We wouldn't fit in glory, would we? I've heard preachers talk about that somebody's going to go to heaven kicking and screaming. That's the most ridiculous thing in the world. To fight apostasy, we must be feeding on the Word of God and we must be growing in the Word of God. Wow. <laughs> Number two, serious prayer. He says here, praying, and we're back to verse 20 of Jude, in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Now what does it mean to be Praying in the Holy Spirit. Well, first of all, it do, what it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be praying in tongues, okay? It's amazing to me how we develop all these crazy -eyed, mechanical ideas from the Word of God. It doesn't mean that we're... That means we have long prayers or flowery prayers or prayers full of great platitudes. Like everything about religion can be somehow or another an impressive show to God. That's not what it's talking about. What it does mean in the Holy Spirit, it means controlled by, influenced by, empowered by. And how does this happen? It is connected back to being built up in the most holy faith, the Word. In fact, all of these four things are absolutely interlocking with one another. In other words, you and I can't have an appropriate prayer life unless we have spent time in God's Word and our hearts are convicted, convinced, and stirred. And you know what I'm talking about. We have individuals in this church then that when they pray, it's like the unction of God is upon them. They didn't go home and practice in front of a mirror and say, now, how can I pray today in such a way that I really sound like I know what I'm doing? <laughs> Silly as that may sound. Because they're really talking to God. Because their heart has been impacted by God. 
If you think about, I won't get you to turn there, but Micah chapter 6, you think about the sacrificial system of worship in the Old Testament, which is always a picture to the Christian. And Micah said that, do you think the Lord takes delight in thousands of rams? We're just going to go out and slaughter all these animals? Now, he was trying to give us a picture, an understanding of the depth and the hardness of sin in doing all of that. But it wasn't just merely the slaying of animals that was impressive to God, and that means that everything's all right with you and me, or in this case, the Jews. But what did he say, for example, in Isaiah 66 too? To this one I will look. To him who is humble, contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. He's talking about a change from within. He's talking about an attitude. He's talking about an understanding. He's talking about a relationship with God. And such that when we're talking about praying in the Holy Spirit, we're talking about someone who is filled up with God. How are they filled up with God? Because they have been in His Word. They're walking with Him like Enoch walked with God. They have the same mind and heart. They're thinking the same thoughts after God. They're living with Him in the midst of a darkened world. There's, just a, there's a light shining because this individual is walking with their Lord. That's the filling of the Spirit. Look with me over at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And verse 26. Now, Paul has already talked about that if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not one of His. The Spirit of God lives within us. And so this idea of praying in the Holy Spirit is certainly anything but grieving the Holy Spirit as we read about in the Scriptures, denying the Holy Spirit. He says in the same way, verse 26, in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. You, you and I can't get in front of the mirror or somewhere else and drum up some kind of a fancy prayer. And, and some people try to do that. In fact, I know people even write their prayers down. And I'm not saying there's necessarily anything wrong with that to read them. But what is, what is really desired here is something that is, has a supernatural nature to it. It's a heart that is filled up with God, such that God is just seen as just oozing out. They can't say enough. There, there, there's, there's, they can't make enough words. It, 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 they don't know how, and that's why he's talking about here. He says, we don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You ever see somebody that they're just so filled with the... The things of God, they just, they're just groaning. They're just, it's almost like they're squeaking or something. And you say, well, how precious that is. It's just oozing out. It's not manufactured. It's not drummed up. But it's real. Groanings here is the idea that the Spirit is moving in our heart. It's a heart that is burdened. A heart that is convicted. You know, one of the things that I see with the church today and the apostasy today is that we're just not concerned. We've just kind of given up. Oh, well, the world's going to be the way it's going to be. Nothing I can do about it. And it's almost as like, well, you know, I don't want to get too deep in the things of God because I get too disturbed by that. <laughs> it just troubles me. What we need to do is be convicted in the Word of God. We need to be troubled in the Word of God. And this applies to everything, and we'll apply later, if we ever get there, to our evangelistic message. You can't go evangelize to people unless my own heart is convicted and stirred. Unless I have the savor of Christ. Paul taught, called it in Galatians, the brand marks of Jesus Christ upon me. 
He says groanings here. And it has to do with the work of God in the heart. The heart is filled up with the things of God, the joy of God, the desires to please Him, the love of God, and all of those things, such that you're walking around with that, and it's like a truck loaded, and it's just, and the springs are on the bottom, and you just need to unload it because you're burdened down with all of it. And you look at the people around you, and they're dying. They're going to hell, and you're worried about it. You're concerned about it because you have the living God. How much of that is going on today? I'm talking to me too. This, I'm preaching to, to myself. If we want to be kept from personal apostasy and a lackluster uh, luster poor testimony, we've got to get in God's Word and we've got to start praying with conviction. Well, I didn't get to first base, but I'm going to have to close. In closing, let me go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. I'm just going to read verses 1 to 13 without comment. Please listen to what Christ is saying. This is again in the context of all this stuff in the world, all these things that seem to be so important, guess what? They're temporary, they're going away, and they're going to become meaningless. Christ is coming again. Christ says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flasked along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout. Behold the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready, who were ready, went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Beloved, the oil in the lamp Just building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. And He's going to give us a couple of other things that we're supposed to be doing too that we didn't get to today. But that's the oil that is so important that our lamps are lit because we don't know when He comes. Built up in the Word, praying in the Holy Spirit. He's going to talk about obedience and he's going to talk about a heart fixed on his return. God help us in this day, because it begins with each one of us personally, individually, to have our priorities right in how we're living. I'm not saying abandon what your job and everything else. We're not talking about that. But there is a sense in which we're doing all these things as unto the Lord Jesus Christ, but number one priority is building ourselves up in the Holy Faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. We'll get to uh, obedience and a heart fixed on His return because that's where our real hope is. May God help us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the fact that Jude has gone to such trouble by Your direction 
to warn us and to richly bless us by giving us what you desire and what you would have us to be. We see the things that have gone on around us as examples. Father, we don't want to be like that. Help us, dear Lord, to walk with you and to know you truly. Help me to be the man that I should be. And help each one of us, Father, to be personally convicted by your precious word that we might be those that have faith when you return. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.